Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever the case may be. Thank you for joining us on a Sunday evening for another episode of Red Fellas, where we will be discussing Man United 2, Liverpool 2. Probably the worst feeling after collecting a point at Manchester United since I've been watching football. Normally, in situations where you come away with a point from your fiercest rivals, you say, we take that and we keep it moving. But that's my personal thoughts. I have tea. I have biscuits. I have red fellas. After a, a frustrating, deeply disappointing game of football like that, you need some people to speak to, and I couldn't have chosen a finer selection of human beings. I have the magnificent red fellas with me. People, thank you very much for joining us. You already know the rules and regulations, the etiquette, call it what you want. Smash a like on your way in. Um, we will be getting into all things Liverpool. The, the headline of the show, the title of the show, Pathetic Finishing Ends Title Chances. I must confess I forgot to add the question mark. It seems like I've made a statement there. But let's just pretend is a question mark. Or maybe not. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. We here, you're here. It's good to talk. Hello, Conroy. Hello, Conroy, and how are you doing? Hey, how are you doing, mate? Uh, um, okay, uh, a bit of deja vu. As the comments just said, feels like the same as it was a couple of weeks ago. So, um, yeah, I think we'll break it down. I'm not going to go on a full-on rant to begin with. I think we'll ease into it today. But yeah, just um, don't know, mate, to be honest, just feels like copy and paste. Just feel like I've seen what was going to happen. Wanted my team to surprise me, learn a re lesson from playing Man United three times a season. And the players didn't. So yeah, to be honest, mate, uh, if, you, if you're here for an optimistic take, I'm not going to be that person tonight. You were the best surprise. person to go to. <laughs> Uh, Dun Inko says it's absolutely disgusting I'm going to go through a few of the comments as we get into it try to get a gauge of the mood of the audience and the and the chat because it's always good to compare and contrast how we're feeling how everyone's feeling am I the only one feeling like this and then you read some statements and then someone else might give you a different perspective so Conroy kind of shares my sentiments it looks like uh, Dun Inko I think is Disgusted, as he says. It's absolutely disgusting how we haven't managed to beat this garbage Man United team even once this season. I love Klopp, but it might just be, it might just be good for him to leave. The bridesmaid level uh, label is real. Harry just says to my title, it hasn't ended at all. It's not over. Arsenal have tough game. One slip up and we win our games. We're back on. Title is gone. Koza says, um, and then he says, going seven out of seven is not possible. Is why is not possible. The players bottled down. Bold it again. Um, yeah, there's a variety of opinions. We've got the usual mods in the in the building. Pimp in distress says, big up the chat. Pixel Page says, big up the red fellas and chat. How do I get rid of this sense of deja vu? Um, yeah, Evan, is there a sense of deja vu? Is there a sense of, wow, we haven't capitalized? Well, what is a sense? What, I, I, can you make sense of it? Deja vu is, is, is a good way to describe it. Um we've faced this quality of this Man United team three times this season, and we've walked away with a cup exit and only four points and no victories. So there's deja vu in, in the confines of this particular campaign. And there's deja vu of going to Old Trafford to face a vastly inferior United team when we're in a title race and they definitely aren't. And we played the occasion uh, in, in, instead of the actual game itself. So yeah, there's there's plenty of deja vuing going around. I would say that's appropriate. Deja vuing seems to be the the phrase or the term used so far. Cav, um, uh, big up Tommy's Islam. Big up this result. I know we're still level, but it hurts. Um, pain. Sorry, case, sorry. Uh, real, real, real quick, Grizz. I I slipped up. I I meant uh, four points dropped. Sorry, folks, we didn't pick up four points. It's four points dropped. Excuse me. Four points dropped. That's what he means. I mean, you know, the chat are eagle eyed. They pick up on every breath. No, th answer. thanks. Thanks for so correcting me, y'all. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Being the resident nerve, you've got to be extra careful. You come with a reputation, my brother. Uh, <laughs> Cav, uh, we've had deja vu, we've had frustration, we've had pain. Uh, mm. Where are you, bro? Where are you? 
Yeah. Do you know what? Usually uh, we have a little bit of time after the games before yeah. we go on and do our podcast. And uh, in that time, I sit, I think, I make some notes, I try to calm down, and I, and I, I try to bring some information to the show. I'm, I'm going to be honest, I couldn't do any of that because my emotions are taking over right now. I am so frustrated so frustrated after that game and and I can't hide it and and I'm going to I'm going to slip up on tonight's podcast I'm going to say some things that I'm probably going to watch back tomorrow and, and regret and I'm trying to put a lot into perspective but I've got to feel I got to be honest with my feelings and that really upset me what I seen today and the result we got so I'm sure a lot of Liverpool fans share this frustration the title's not gone but it it feels like it has. That's that's the level of emotion that I'm feeling after today's game. Uh, people that are joining us late obviously didn't hear my uh, excuse or reason. I, I said I forgot to put question mark at the end of the title. And title chances. Oh, please, Dahir says, no, I don't think it's the end of our title chances. It's supposed to be a question mark at the end of it. But hey, look, abuse away. <laughs> it is what it is, man. Um, we, we, we'll take it on, man. We'll take it on. Um, there you go. He's doubled up. We still find a way. Level on points. Pathetic headline. Respectfully, Mr. Gris. Well, at least you've been respectful about calling it a pathetic headline, which is still something. Uh, coming up to 250, you guys camped in here already. Uh, really appreciate the love and support. Big up the chats. Please smash the likes buttons. Conroy talks and Conroy is going to talk about the lineup. Um, I guess it's always the staff talking point because in these kind of situations, with players coming back, sort of, is there going to be any changes? What have we learned from the last game? Do we change anything formation-wise, personnel-wise? Well, I think, guys, how many changes from the last time we play? Is it just the one or two? Uh, someone help me out here. Mm. Kwanza 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 Bradley Kwanza starts Kwanza. here instead of Joe Gomez. Mm -hmm. That's it? Uh, Kwanzaa Kwanza for Kanate <laughs> in the last game. Didn't Kwanzaa start the last game? No, Kanate started, didn't he? Okay. Yeah, Ooh, and then he got he got you know someone flew into his into his kneecap, which is probably why he didn't start today. No, no, game. sorry, I meant from the United game. Oh, United. Sorry, I thought we were talking about the Two last weeks game. Ago. Mm, no, Kwanzaa started that one. So yeah. So Sabozalai comes in, and Connor Bradley comes in. I think they're the two changes from the last game, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Thanks, Lucas. Yeah. But um, what did you make of it, um, especially the? Ubukanato, when I guess is the real talking point, he makes the squad, which suggests he's not injured per se. Um, but after that horror tackle, maybe that's the reason, or do you think there's a tactical reason? Probably that as well. Probably still to get back to be a hundred percent as well. Kanate and Kwanzaa has stepped up a lot this season, so Klopp probably didn't think twice about putting him in this game. He's already played at Old Trafford this season so I think it makes sense with Kanati like in the past we've seen it even this season we've rushed players back too quickly in a continuous starting and this continuously been in starting 11 coming back from an injury so probably from that uh, during the week as well and the fact that he just came back in, in general it makes a lot of sense to go with Kwanzaa and I mean hindsight's a wonderful thing we're going to talk about today but he's done a job This he's put Kwanzaa on at Wembley in a League Cup final in extra time against Chelsea so He's, he's got he's had the experience this season, so I was okay with that to be honest, Chris. I think the other one with, with Gomez being on that side, um, even the last time a couple of weeks ago, United got out Gomez quite early uh, down the left side in the, the first half. So he actually didn't have the best for 30 minutes in that game, so I was okay with Bradley. He's he's a t attacking ability could cause them problems, so I had no issues with the starting lineup. Mm, Liverbird reminds <clears> me or corrects me if I'm he says three changes. Ibu, Endo, and Connor uh, are the three changes. Um, if we we saw the lineup, as I said. Let me just bring that back up again. I mean, the lineup. Did you have any um, apprehensions before the game? Was you confident um, with this lineup that is good enough to beat this Man United? Surely. Well, yeah. I mean, even with the um, omission of Kanate, um, you know, Kwanzaa has repaid our faith in him um we'll get on to eventually what happens but just looking at the lineup there's nothing particularly wrong with that would have been nice to have kanate just because they had some joy down the right hand side in our meeting with them in the cup um and we also know that bradley 
Um, like Robertson has the green light to go and become an attacker in possession. He has the green light to go press, which he all did um, very well um, today, uh, but we'll get into it. But yeah, I didn't have any great issue with this lineup, Grizz. I mean, just j with, with the exception of Kanate, if you, if you had to, if Klopp had to pick a team to start a Champions League final tomorrow, you know, that would probably be it from the available keyword available options yeah we, we've discussed this before haven't we Cav about the Kwanzaa um, and Bradley even stepping into the mm -hmm. team and we shouldn't really look at them as youngsters they're actual first team squad players now um, yeah. first teamers uh, we know Kwanzaa's played a, a, a tremendous amount of games we know Cuevan Kelleher has now beaten the amount of appearances uh, mm -hmm. that Ellison's made this season so and the midfield we it's kind of since Curtis Jones injury, it's been our go-to midfield, isn't it? There was there a case of, and obviously we'll get into the actual substitutions that were made. But was the midfield uh, what you would have ideally done? There was some calls, and I think I was one of them that wanted Curtis Jones to start. Obviously, I didn't know his fitness levels, but I thought if he's fit enough, I wanted him to start. I wasn't really too bothered about protecting our defense, so to speak. So I would have loved McAllister. Uh, Enzo, sorry, McAllister, Sabozalai and Curtis Jones, but it wasn't to be Harvey Elliott again, unlucky to miss out. Mm, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I think when we did our little preview for the for the game, I, I wanted to see Curtis Jones come back in. Um, I think the little twenty minute cameo you see in as a substitute in the last game shown that he, you know, he was going to put in the levels that you'd seen prior to his um, injury. He seemed to just come into that game seamlessly and pick up where he left off. I know it's not a whole lot of minutes to sort of go off, but if he was a if he was fit enough to play, I'd have liked to see him start. I think he's a super intelligent footballer, really understands what, you know, Klopp asks of him or what the midfield needs. But on paper, this this probably is your strongest midfield. Um, don't, uh, Endo coming back in is great. You know, uh, you know, he gets a knock, gets a knock that keeps him out of the last game, but he's been performing really well this season. We've given him his flowers when when uh, he's put in them good performances. McAllister obviously goes without saying starts. The only question really was was Sabozalai then, and and whether you'd play him still and keep the faith in him and hope that his performances continue to improve because I think they have been, um, or you you put Elliot in. And to be honest with you, I think it's it's a real shame for Elliot that he's not starting because I don't see what what more, and we'll talk about his cameo when he comes on, but, you know, prior to this game, what more he can do to warrant a start. You know, the kid is is really understanding the games. He's uh, playing his part with the link up, the tempo, his build up, and the quality that he's showing is is really brilliant. So it seems unfortunate that he's not starting. And I, I can only think it's because we believe that Sabozalai has got real levels to go. And we're just trying to give him that opportunity to go up them levels. And we I think, believe that he could probably be a better fit in that midfield than perhaps Elliot would be. But right now, I would say Elliot's the better performer and probably deserved to start. But I, I must admit, when I see in the starting lineup come, up, come about, I'm like, yeah, OK, it's a buzz of life. Fair enough. You know, I'm not going to scream too much about it. And then the front three picks itself, I think. I know what you mean. Exactly my feelings about the Elliot and the sub -like scenario. Curtis Jones, obviously, still working his way back to fitness. And obviously, we we would start getting into the game. Uh, Yo, what's good? Sends in a super chat. Uh, thank you very much for the super chat. He says, "Don't think we played the occasion. We played the way Klopp likes, in my opinion. Hundred miles per hour football, which I think suits United. In my humble opinion, more. I think, or whatever. Yeah, I think he's trying to say big pitch, lots of space. <laughs> Conroy, we we all screamed and we all spoke about." We've got to learn from our mistakes. And one of the mistakes that we've been making, not only in the United game, but in, in pretty much every game, is the slow start. Well, lo and behold, I think young Kwanzaa gives it away early, straight away. Um, and Ganacho is caught just offside. Um, we've done it again. Not only him, Sabozalai, so sloppy with the ball. Now, there is many differences stylistically with Curtis Jones and Sabozalai. But one of the major differences is Curtis Jones has had a chance to play this midfield for the past 18 months, 12 months, whereas Sabozla is literally his first three months and he hasn't played midfield much. He played uh, for Leipzig on the flanks predominantly as an attacker. Um, 
it's a total different way of playing. So Bozlai again and again and again kept giving the ball away. Was you as frustrated or was you angry? I'd say, yeah, I was, I was quite frustrated with that, Grizz. I think the thing is, Curtis Jones probably has went against him at times, but his ability to like keep the ball and just even like that be that metronome and just like not give the ball away is one of his biggest strengths. And at times he's overthinking on the ball and not releasing it at the right time has been a frustration in the past, but he's very good at that. Sometimes it's like a player like Sabozlai, especially maybe looking to find a pass, they're maybe a bit more, not as complacent the right word, but they're looking for other things instead of a uh, they're, they're trying to see the, the full picture to make things happen, which I understand. But I think Curtis Jones is more well-drilled in that position at the moment. But also, Sabozla is not in great form, and we, we all could all agree with that. He's trying to play himself back into that. So it was frustrating, but I will be honest, I felt like I did think we started better, barring that moment where Ganacho, which again was a bit crazy, um, but the pass was was far too slow to get through to them but if that had been timed correctly they could have been through but I did feel we did start better even though certain players were being sloppy on the ball I did feel like as uh, I think was it Cav just said a second or was it Evan it was about um, or maybe in the chat actually sorry it was one of the, the super chats saying about me and you Chris had discussed about we play the occasion far too often in this game and don't just play our our game against that inferior team I did see signs at the start that we were trying to play our game to be honest I did feel okay in the first 20, 30 minutes or so. Um, <clears throat> Jorge, is that how I pronounce it, guys? Jorge? Es, 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 so. es, Ezequiel Ortiz, Ortiz? I mean, I've probably butchered it, but listen, respect me for actually trying. Um, thank you. He says, Grizz, mic a bit low. Could he fix it, please? The rest of the stream is amazing. I have fixed it. Thank you very much. It was on... I hadn't even connected this expensive microphone that I've got guys hopefully that should be much better guys um yeah we did start off much better than the first okay we had far more control and far more dominance than the FA Cup game a lot of people are saying it was similar to the FA Cup game Evan did you find it similar to the FA Cup game I I, I personally didn't you, you know it, it took a little a little while for this particular game to have the tennis match ebb and flow that the FA Cup game was for the most part. This this match, United were, I thought, more organized. You know, it's more organized as they can be. I mean, I, I don't think anybody, uh, regardless of the fan base that they represent, would call United a well-coached team. Um, but the, in this particular instance, their press was better. They were a little bit more impact, uh, compact, still offering us plenty of space to do our thing and, and create chances and create shots. But this, it, it, it only disintegrated into the tennis match flow after a certain point. Once, you know, X amount of legs had gone, once, you know, certain parts of the game state had started to break down. But for, from the offset, it wasn't really like that. And I, and I don't know if I wanted it to be like that because I, because I saw how wasteful and kind of sloppy we were in in the cup when it when it just became you know counter attack after counter attack that just ended in ended in sort of ruin and I and I thought that maybe if we were forced to be more patient our composure in front of goal would improve um, and for the most part even though um, we didn't get the second goal before halftime i was i was happy in the, with the way we were uh manufacturing chances in the first half specifically um i you know i thought they came from the right sort of patterns um i i thought they came from moments of patience when we could have rushed it but you know all that matters is that liverpool did not finish off the game in the first half yeah it was the craziest first half we'd get into the overall general feeling of the first half but we get into the incidents and we take the lead have we actually take the lead this is going to be i think our first point of frustration <laughs> in a many in a many few incidents of frustrating uh, uh levels but this is the first point of frustration we actually take the lead and it's mm. actually a set piece despite all our good build-up play like evan's discussing and discuss sorry in terms of our build-up patience knew exactly where to target them even if they were more defensively resolute i think the 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 
the selection of Casemiro instead of McTominay would have naturally made them more organised because Casemiro has that experience, maybe not the legs. McTominay is more of a chaser, whereas yeah. Casemiro sat in his position. And maybe that's why Evan thinks that it was a bit more controlled from their point of view. I still yeah. think they were shit. Uh, I think they were crap. And I think we were toying with them and walking through them. And despite all that, our first goal comes from a set piece. Nunes gets a flick on and a very, again, we're going to say it, a very Sadio Mane-esque finish from Luis Diaz to give us the lead. Yeah, exactly that. Um, Liverpool are, are good at set pieces and and, and that, the statistics always baffle me because I never feel like we score enough from them. Uh, and usually they come from, you know, a flick on or, you know, the second phase of a set piece, never a direct header into the goal, if you like. Um, but it's Nunes who runs across his man towards the to the near post, gets the flick on and just puts it into the back stick area where it can land to anybody. But it falls to Diaz, who's in acres of space and does well to manipulate his body, really, to, to not get some kind finish. of... Yeah, because he's, you know, he's having to react. It's all pretty instinctual. And, um, you know, he ends up doing this sort of sideways sort of scissor kick, hits it into the ground and uh, and it ends up sort of bobbling up between Anana and the other United player and goes in. And it's and it's a good finish. Um, and, it, and it comes about just through a, a being aggressive making sure that you're the guy that goes and gets the head up on the ball, you know, and not just allowing United to come away and head the ball and clear it, possibly get a counter attack, you know, win that first duel and anything can happen. And and, and we got the goal and, um, and it's, it's fair play to Diaz because we're going to talk about some individual performances, but he, if anybody was worthy of a goal today out of the forwards, you'd probably say it's him based on the hard work that he's been putting in. And the only man that seems to be trying to make something happen and being a bit dynamic, he, he deserves the fortune of the ball fall into him in an area where he can go and took it away. Um, so it's a great finish. And at that point, much like a lot of us, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're thinking, oh, thank God we've got the first goal. Thank God. Now it's now it's really in our hands. We know we're the better team. We've been sloppy up until this point, but, you know, they've had one or two chances. We're going to get better. We're going to take control. We've now got the lead. We can manage this game now. You know, we can we can decide, you know, we can probe, we can sit back, we can, you know, pile on the pressure if need be. This United crowd can can get on the uh, players' backs. Bruno Fernandes will throw his toys out the pram. Rashford will go missing. And we're just going to pile the pressure on, you know. And you just think from that point onwards, this is it. This, this is what you wanted. The, you know, 20, 22 minutes in, you've got the lead. Now is about kicking on and... We'll discuss what happened after that, but certainly a good goal to uh, to to score and a good time and and like I say, it was good for Diaz to to be the man on the end of it. it is Diaz is the man in recent weeks, um, picking up vital goals, scoring vital goals. Um, Conroy, I think I think we were in total deep control. I think it was the perfect start. Um, I think I WhatsApped in our group, didn't I? And I said the same thing. I said, finally, we take the lead. Come on now. I was convinced we will not make the same mistakes. There was just a, a lot of talk about not lear learning from our mistakes, being more ruthless. Even Jurgen Klopp was speaking about it. And I thought our play was very measured. And again, McAllister was at the heart of it. I thought McAllister was a standout again. Lots of pretty patterns, a lot of working angles, a lot of shooting opportunities, a lot of opportunities to create opportunities. This time, this is why I don't think it was like the first game of the FA Cup game. Whereas Man United, it was a basketball match. And in that opening 20 minutes, Man United could have been 2 3 and up. This was total domination. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, Conroy. It was literally boys against men. Surely you must have thought it's a matter of time. Or was you thinking the opposite? No. Oh, shit. No, not with this team. They've shown me too many times that they just they can miss make miss unthinkable chances this season. Um, we scored a lot. I'm not disputing that, but it gets to a point where you, you you just see when they get in a position where usually you get two or three of them in a match. Well, against Man United at Old Trafford in two games, I think we've had fit, maybe say twelve opportunities. In this game, it was even worse because this, the game at Old Trafford, which frustrated me, it was the it was the, the final third pass. Well, we actually made the correct pass a lot of the time, and it was just the final decision in today's game. But no, Chris, to be honest, this team at the moment right now, and it's maybe reactionary, 
But any time they get an opportunity, and I'm always like that at Old Trafford anyway, anyway but when they get on a break, because there's so much space, because as Evan said, this Man United team were done after 20 minutes with a press. Their shape is all over the place at times because what happens is they leave massive gaps in the middle of the park. And we have so many opportunities and we get there and you're just thinking they're going to make the wrong decision. They're going to make the wrong decision. And today it was like the second half of Old Trafford, but we, we went to the next level. And then it was the finishing part. And I'm not having it, guys. I'm not having great block, great block. No, 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 no. This is elite sport. If you have one opportunity, you should be finding a corner. And I just feel like it, I find it really frustrating today that what you're seeing is it, it, it shouldn't be off the cuff. It should be drilled in. If a player is there and that ball goes through there, the, the ball has to be a cutback. The run has to be a cutback each time. And today they were finding players, but they were hitting men. You've got a full goal and they're hitting, they're hitting the one defender there. It's it's not good enough. And mm -hmm. I just felt today, after what I was watching, I had a bad feeling. Just very similar to, to that game. Just not even arrogance today, to be honest. Just the lack of lack of yeah. I think I think you made, I think, clinical clinicalness. Yeah. I think I think you're spot on about it. it. Wasn't a lack of arrogance today. I sensed a lack of arrogance in the FA Cup game today. Wasn't yeah. a lack of yeah. arrogance. Uh, I don't know what it was. Um, Carlton Banks says, what a tash that is. Um, Evan quickly hopped off stream to check if he, if, if it was all intact, but he's back to, uh, and it's all intact. He's talking about you. Evan, I, I'm in agreement with Conroy. That comes to, um, um, when you're at this high elite level sport and in this game of this magnitude and you've played the opposition three weeks ago, and we all know the reasons why you didn't win that game. Never mind win, you lost, you ended up losing that game. A team of our caliber, a team of our coach, coach's caliber, I expect, I demand better, and so would a clock, and so would of our forwards from themselves. Um, what is it? Was it? Uh, is it a collective? Collective, the, the 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 quality of chances maybe wasn't as good as we think. I don't know if you've had a chance to look at sort of the quality of chances, um, if there's any data to back or, 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 or refute that. I just thought we had the chances to create extremely good chances, but we didn't. We ended up making them, that was a chance, instead of that was a huge chance. Do you know what I mean? Maybe, maybe I'm not. Yeah, I mean, when, when you when you look at the moments where we were a touch or two away from sticking the ball in the back of the net, um, when we didn't, there was really only I don't know two or two or three occasions. You know, uh, Silva Sly um, probably should have scored from a great cross from Robertson. Uh, Nunez definitely should have squared it to Silva Sly in the second half for a tap in. Um, so yeah, if if you look at you know the XG values of each chance, you know it's not super ridiculously high um, for for each one. But I get what you mean, Grizz. So so often we get into the final third against Manchester United and other teams in, in recent weeks. is not just it's not something that just has been rearing its head when we when we face United. We so so often the final ball is lacking. So often the final run is uh too hasty and we get caught off sides um just not the right decisions um are, are being made um it, it, it's it's not so much that the uh you, you know the, the the efforts on goal are are so horrible you know we tend we tend to work the keeper but it's just it, it it's a th there's a lack of maturity uh, out there i think in the final third which is unfortunate um, you know, it, it's, it's pretty bad, but we generate an incredible amount of shots. And the fact that all of this dominance and all of this individual quality and all of these raw attempts at goal have not resulted in a single win against Manchester United this season just isn't okay. Um, I don't know if y'all knew this, but in our two Premier League games against United this season, we've taken 62 shots. And no side has ever had more shots against a single opponent in a season on record in the competition. And 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 we we have not generated a win from that. And that is unacceptable. I, I mean I, I see people having a go uh, a go at Klopp for not 
somehow not managing these situations better. Klopp's system, Klopp's ethos, Klopp's team selection has resulted in us taking more shots against an opponent than they've ever faced in a single season. You know, Klopp was not half the footballer that all these guys are. What, how is he supposed to do? Go into training and lead an example? You know, he's, he said, absolutely, I, I, that's not how I coach. But, you know, I we just have not been clinical in in, in moments uh, this season. And it, it's, it's, it's unfortunate because I, I, I look up and down the lineup and I see clinicality in there. I, I see ruthlessness in some of these attacking players. But they either haven't shown it in key moments or they have not been available enough to show it. Um, so that's, that's particularly, particularly frustrating. Um, and I, and I, I think nobody would be more frustrated than Jurgen Klopp because he's manufactured. He's yeah. Oh, I, Oh yeah. He, he, he has built a team that I don't think has uh, put out a full strength lineup in the league since Christmas. And we are still right up there at the top for the title race. And we are now just shooting ourselves in the foot, uh, essentially. Really, really shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, it, it, it's, it's, it's complex. And sometimes sports absolutely just don't make any sense. You know, all, all, of, this, all of this dominance, all of the, sh- the shot records, the possession records, all of these things just don't always result in in, in a five nil demolition seven nil demolition sometimes you have these sort of freak occurrences and this is where perhaps data and coaching and repetition reaches its limit because some of these things really are unexplainable you know what i mean i i don't know how you you quantify what what we saw out there using all the empirical empirical evidence we have available to us Guys, uh, 500 of you guys in here, really appreciate that and really love that support. If you could smash a like button for me now, that would be amazing uh, because I'm about to ask Kaf to try to make sense of this halftime sort of graph um, thanks to FootMob. Um, actually, this is from the website. This is Anfield who used FootMob. Um, it shows, Kaf, and mm-hmm. me, you know me and graphs and algebra and all of this i usually whatsapp evan to make it make sense for me but even i can make sense of this right because i don't know if you can see my my what i'm pointing to the, the 15 shots by half time cap these are 15 shots <clears throat> and and some and majority of them inside penalty box in the first half compared to zero yet this is what I meant about big chances. Yet yeah, we've only created two big chances. It says according to their data, two mm-hmm. miss chance, uh, two big chances created, fifteen shots. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Four shots on target. Sorry, three big chances. Obviously, two, one taken. Obviously, sorry, yeah, and two missed. And I don't. Even, there's no point looking at Man United's because we know they didn't have a single shot on off or target. Mm-hmm. How and this is? Do you remember just before half time? I think there's a break. No, we know there's a breakdown of a move because it was every thirty seconds, and we saw Klopp being so frustrated. And I think that's how you felt as well at half time. Mm. Yeah, blimey. Well, there's a lot to digest in this in this game and this first half in particular. I, I, I'll start off by some positives. We we improve our passing. We, we, we become less sloppy with it and, and then we were able to sort of push up the pitch. Defensively, we were sound. Every sort of break they had, we were able to lock up and we managed to get into the scenario that we like to get to whereby we're playing in their half of the pitch and we're able to win the, the ball back early and, and regenerate attacks, right? On the occasions they did get forward, I thought McAllister in particular was excellent at ball recovering again and we will build up. And that build up, as Conroy says, came because there was just a huge gap in midfield. Huge. I think Maino went tight with McAllister and didn't do a particularly good job because he was just being passed out of it or rolled out of it. Casemiro isn't particularly mobile and God knows where he was positionally. And you would it just felt like we could just run through that midfield at will. You know, at times Sabozalai was just carrying the ball through there. I think Salah comes central at one point and just 
you know, felt a bit surprised that he had so much space and was like, oh, I can start running and do whatever I want. But yeah, you can, but make sure whatever you want is something progressive, you know. Um, so that's all really positive, creating situations whereby you can go and create and dominate midfield and dominate in defence and so on. But it felt like when we got to the final third, quite often, unless it was an overlap on the left with um, Robertson, I didn't see the forwards very connected. And it seems crazy to say this about a team and forwards that have got the goals and assists that they have, but they kind of play, play like strangers at times. And I don't feel like they help each other out much. When we talk about patterns and, and stuff, quite often if, if your midfield is driving at, at central at, at the opposition's box and you've got a forward in front of you, a forward on the left and right, you'd expect one of them to make a run across the box to take a defender away. You know, you'd expect one of them to sort of drop off and offer a one-two. But we always, always seem a bit static. We always seem to be running in the same direction, just waiting for which pass is going to be played. And sometimes, although you have the numbers, it's not intelligent enough movement. You know, and I felt like that happened so often. We weren't recreating angles when we got into the final third. And quite, and when you see it with the likes of Arsenal and Man City, what they're really good at is when they overload numbers, whether it's on the break or, or on the build-up, usually on the break, sorry. When they get to that 18-yard box, one of the players is selfless. It, whether it's a centre-forward moving out wide to create space into the centre or someone offering a one-two to try and work the ball to the edge of the 18-yard box so it can be pulled back or whatever. There's real intelligence shown when they, and it, that's why they always seem to score these goals where they're just tapping it in or a man's found in the box so free. It's selfless running for your teammates. I felt at times Diaz is trying to be too individual. Nunes is too much head down and just trying to get shot away or caught in and, and, sh and shoot. And Salah's just not trying at all, to be honest with you. Um, I was really disappointed in what he's shown today. So, I think that in years gone by, we had the famous front three. When we got in them scenarios, Bobby would drop off or we would run wide and Salah would cut in or Mane would run across his man and there was a real understanding between them. This front three haven't got that yet. Their, their goals come about because of their raw ability and their, in the intensity that they can play with and the chance creation that the, the midfield and the fullbacks create. But they've got to work on that intelligence. As a, as a, they've got to be connected as a forward line because you'll have days like today where you create and create and create, or you create situations where it really should be one or two passes and tucked away, but it doesn't happen. Um, so I just think incredibly frustrating. And I think I would say there is only one player on the pitch today that was able to play 90 minutes of football with both intensity and intelligence, and that's McAllister. I think a lot of players can play with intensity, work hard, create situations and battle. And some players, a little bit like Mo Salah, play a little bit slower with intelligence, but, but we have very few players that play with both. And McAllister's one of them. He can battle and work hard, but when he gets on the ball, he more often than not does the right thing. Carries the ball when he needs to carry it, plays it wide when he needs to play it wide, you know, shoots when he needs to shoot and plays a through ball when he needs to. Intelligence and intensity is what I think a lot of our players lack. And that's perhaps just something that we should expect with where yeah. we are in our development. Oh, you're, you're spot on, Cav. This is yeah, why yeah. Th this is why I, I love the Red Fellas. Um, and this is why, because I, I was listening to you and I was actually calming down as I was listening to you. And I, I know you wanted counselling today from the <laughs> others, but you've managed to give us therapy. And, and look, I think, I think pretty much you've nailed some of the points that I wanted to talk about. And we forget where we are with this team. It is a new team. It is a new attack. It is a new defense. It is a new midfield. What does that mean? That means it's a new team. I've just mentioned three three sec all the three sections of the team. In fact, even the goalkeeper's different from previous seasons. He's played the most amount of games. So therefore the understanding and the chemistry and the link up play won't be as smooth. Obviously we've been treated to the most cold-blooded, efficient, ruthless front three in the history of our great football club in Mane, Bobby and Salah. But they developed that over a number of years. This is pretty much a, a brand new attack. Diaz, Nunes and Salah, maybe a year, you know, I think. Uh, yeah, about a year or so. And then obviously Gakpo coming in and out. And obviously with Jota missing. So there is elements that we need to sort of 
give a bit of context and rationale to. We are going to have games, like you said, where because they're great players and because we've got the likes of McAllister in midfield, we are going to create chances, but there won't be, you know, the chances that a Bobby Firmino would create, for example, for a Mane on a plate. They'll be through sheer force and ability. And I think Sabozla is probably the embodiment of what you said in terms of he had everything except composure. I thought Sabozla's parting was off, but I thought his running power, his running, his energy, yeah. getting into the right spaces was fantastic. It was like the early part of the season, but he had no composure at the end of it. And mm -hmm. you're right, that comes with time. He's a young player. Um, I thought, just on Sabozla, yeah, I sorry. thought, as, as I'm watching the game, just a quick point, and, and feel free guys to chime in on this. As I was watching that game, I was looking at Spazzle and I was thinking, a coach has got to get hold of him. Yeah, if someone's absolutely. got to get hold of him. Someone's got to sit him down. They've got to they've got to educate him on the game. You know, they've got to educate him on where the, where his teammates are going to be, what movements are going to be made, and where he needs to find himself, and what kind of patterns he needs to be part of. Because you can see it. Today's game is a perfect example of where he is in his career and his, his Liverpool career, where the ability and the running power and the shot power and the passing it's all there. But it was like he sort of was reacting to things as it was happening, as opposed to knowing the picture before he played the ball, you know? Like, and I just, I, I watched today's game and I was like, please, the next coach, whoever it is, someone sit him down or work with him on the training pitch. Give him the time and focus he deserves, right? To make him aware of what he needs to do on the pitch. Because once it's his vision and what's asked of him is clear, I have no doubt about it that this guy will be incredible. But we know, but we know what we've done with other midfielders and how we've elevated their games. Elliot Jones, Ginny and Henderson before that, uh, or McAllister, mm. you know, in a short space of time. Sabozla is young and he's coming in and he will. There is frustration there. Anyone that thinks, oh, Chris is a massive fan and he's just, you know, positive about Sabozla. I'm saying I'm I'm very disappointed in his final ball, is in, exec in his ex execution. And I agree with you in terms of a coach, a top coach. What you need, what a coach needs is talent to work with. And if mm. anyone's, or athleticism or something in his game that a, co a top coach can work with, if you're saying you don't see nothing in Sabozla's game, then football ain't for you. But if you're saying, no, there is something there, it just needs to be harnessed, needs to be coached, then we're on the right track before we it's get just into a, it. Go on. Yeah, it's just a bit un unrefined is what I would say yes. Sabozla like, comes across because clearly, clearly there's something to refine there. You know, he's lightning in a bottle and he's got the physical gifts. He's got the technical gifts. He's got the Chaos engine. Maker, got... Clock calls him. Yeah, absolutely. So clearly, I mean, the the the, the, the numbers, people like me love Sabozla. The, under, the underlying stuff is great. It's a bit unrefined at times but hey this is this is a young midfield going through a rebuild this was to be expected it's just unfortunate that it reared its head a bit today yeah. it's uh, it's funny while we're doing the stream uh, uh rush rush the monkey is watching the game and he's going through the chances while we're watching and he goes chance three <laughs> great ball by Samos Nunes who tries to find Diaz first time can just take 100%. a percent yeah. Yeah. This. This. This is a good. I've, thing. This I've, is a good I've, thing. I've brought them yeah. down. I've brought them down as well. Earlier, I've yeah. brought them. I've got my phone. I've got about seven chances. So it's subjective on what you define by chances because I think Sabozla. So like, so I'll get his name pronunciation wrong. So I'm just going to say Sobo. When he plays the ball at the end to Bradley, that should be a goal. That's a chance at the end of the first half. That should be a goal. Should be getting the shot away. The passes behind him. Diaz after Nunes dummy hits the defender. That should be a shot on target. That should be passed. Uh, Onana. People might say that's not a big chance, but you're literally free against two. There's there's Salah in the second half skies it from three yards. Salah in the first half skies it when Sobo plays it back. That's another. This is elite sport. This is not me and you having a kick about at five sides. This is top. If you get a chance twelve yards out, that's a big chance in my opinion anyway. So. Mm. I just I, think I, 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 want to get into, I, I, I want to get into some of the chances and I want to get your I want to get our reasoning and opinions on where we went wrong but I just got a couple of super chats and we, we won't go off point too much um, Yo what's good says our game management is poor call me crazy but the scoreline is level in most games I worry we seem more suited to a game state while we're chasing it's mad isn't it we just suddenly go mad when we're chasing um, mm. and we're going to talk about game management in the first I don't know how many minutes of the second half um, Plano boy says, so sorry, but Klopp is a butler. Can't get off the line when it matters the most. City, United, Luton, too many draws. I'm done. 
Come on. Come on. And it's, 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 Klopp, Klopp was supposed to run in and hit it and convert all those tap-ins that, that, the, that, that these multi-million pound footballers missed. Come on. Come on. Uh, plan, plan up, Klopp actually coached a 4-5 nil day. Like he actually coached yeah, a 4-5 yeah. nil That's day dismantling it. job. Uh, yeah. Imaka says, when, we were going to, when are we going to address the elephant in the room? Uh, thank you for the super chat, by the way. Klopp has managed the lineups terribly the last three weeks. Kanate missing again for a big game. Um, and obviously, we're going to stick on that. Konate doesn't be to, need to be played in another non-Premier League game this season. Enough is enough, Klopp. It's clear we can't finish. Defence is key now. I think it's harsh to Conroy to speak about the defence and blame attached to any defence. Because we'll get into the second half. I thought Kwanzaa had a brilliant game. I'm going to say it. I thought he was brilliant. Except that fatal mistake. One fatal mistake. And it's a mistake, but let's, let's call a spade a spade. It's a stunning finish from Bruno Fernandes. Call it, what we can say what we want <laughs> yeah, about it's... him and talk about him in any shape or way or form. But that's a stunning finish. It is a fatal mistake because it leads to a goal. But a young player like that playing at Old Trafford can happen. He can, but he's old enough and he's big enough to be in the first team, so he's old enough and big enough to get criticism for crucial mistakes like that. It's still a massive mistake. Like I think was it the pre-season friendly at Old Trafford where Inanna got absolutely lambasted for doing for another player giving the ball away and he got lobbed from the relative about the same distance. Um, I don't see the same energy towards Kelleher for that, but that's football. Um, it's obviously the keeper can't do nothing about it. Just like in that example, if a player gives it away, in your standard position, to, when you have the ball, you're going to get caught out. But it's just a poor pass. He's blindsided. He just makes an error. It happens. You get on with it. At the end of the day, mistakes will happen. As we said a couple of weeks ago, it's been pretty plain sailing, pretty impressive from Bradley and Kwanzaa. But football's not like that. You're going to have ups and downs. So it happens. It's a mistake. We, we move on. But if the uh, the forwards had done their job, then it would have been four one five one, not 1-1. One, one. So there's Thank got you. to be an element of that Thank and you. that. And, and also, also, this is what annoys me as well. Arsenal are fantastic defensively right, right now, but the way we are playing definitely puts us more, <clears throat> there's more space in behind for uh, even the first minute, Grizz, when Garnacho gets in. like So you could have two great centre-backs. Your full defence could be outstanding, but if you're playing that risk-reward style, there's always going to be more chance that a team could catch you on transition. So I just think sometimes that's a bit unfair as well. Um, but yeah, the forwards were the for from me today. The forwards are the main focus because anyone can have a moment like that. It's outstanding finish. But if the forwards do their job, we're talking about a consolation goal, not equaliser. And I think that is very important to remember. Uh, LFC Sudan, he says we. I think he might have sent this in before we discussed about the new, you know, time to settle. They do need connectivity. They do need coaching. They need to time on the training ground. This is their first season. It's a brand new team. We thought it's Klopp 2.0. Little did we know it's Klopp. I don't know. It's the final swan song of this team. And he's made this new team. And they will get better. The understanding between the forwards will get better. There's absolutely no doubt about it. There will be refined changes. He says, we're not able to finish our goal. Sometimes I feel the Klopp's don't, players don't understand each other. Yeah, that's probably fair, actually. One's Egyptian, one's Portuguese, one's... Uruguayan, you know, there is probably sometimes don't understand each other at, at some points. And there's Curtis Jones uh, uh, speaking scouts behind them. It's something new to be improved in training. Klopp to be blamed for not working on it. I think it's harsh. I think LFC Sudan, that's a bit just, you know, reactionary. You think that we, we are where we are, you know, without yeah. any training done on the on, on, on the training ground or sort of coaching just, the training just ground. go to the youtube channel they, they post little compilations of them shooting every other week i mean i <laughs> like w w what do y'all want I, I don't understand i'm sorry yeah imaka imaka says tires are fine margins kwanzaa ain't ready period i totally disagree with that i really appreciate your support and thank you for the super chat totally disagree i think if anything he's shown that he's absolutely ready and he's come mm -hmm. on leaps and bounds go on can go on, go on. Just to add to that, Grizz, just on my point as well, you get criticised for a mistake, but Virgil van Dijk's the best defender in the world and he made an absolute error against Arsenal that was horrific yep. and pivotal when he was losing a game. So everyone makes mistakes like that, that these are 
anomalies, if you will. It's not actually part of the process and how, how you're set up and the structure. It can happen. So that would be my comparison with that. I understand we're frustrated, but these things can happen. And I think it's good to remember that, that the best in the world can do that against Arsenal, then a young kid who's been outstanding can also make mistakes. Our friend Rosh has uh, reached uh, this Diaz goal. Goal chance five, he says. So that means we've had four chances before that. He's finally got to the goal. Great stuff. But this is honestly, if I wasn't here, I'd be doing keep, that. Keep Even going, Rosh. <laughs> keep going. Let's see how many chances you can get to by the end of the show. Um, <laughs> um, guys, yeah, it's just the second half's bonkers. Like, Actually, I don't know if you can find out, Ev. Like, when Kwanzaa gives that ball away, what's the expected goal for that shot, for uh, that chance, for that scenario? They, they, I saw it posted already. It's like 0 0.02. So that's my it's, point. It's, it's not a yeah, fatal... It's, it's a brilliant finish. Yeah. To, to, to be honest, I mm. we, we could have done... Now that we're in the second half, I'll, I'll talk about it. We could have done more to control that game and... Really get, yeah. re re really get at them, really get at them in the way that our first 45 allowed us to do. And this is when I thought the game disintegrated into the tennis match at, at times because the crowd, the crowd, they get the crowd back into it. We sort of gift wrap them a goal. But if, if I look at the actual defending, you know, Kwanzaa defended well, Bradley defended well. That, that Matthew. right hand side, that right hand side was not exposed in the same way that it was um, by Rashford and co in the cup. And their two goals come from one that we gift wrapped from them, which still required an immense level of technical quality to turn into a goal. Um, and then their, their second goal is just an incredible shot. It's, it's, it's unsavable. I don't even think we defended it poorly. Um, so it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's wildly, wildly frustrating. But this this is where I would actually start to levy some of my criticism at sort of just controlling the game. This is this is where I wanted the mentality monsters to show up, and I don't think they did because any time um, in this sort of fixture, this sort of heated fixture, even the most professional teams putting on the most professional displays in these types of fixtures, teams will be playing the occasion for five to 10 minute spells, right? The occasion always rears its head. So when we gift them the equalizer, that's for me is when the occasion starts to take control of the game state. Now that's not necessarily a bad thing because in, in previous years, if you wanted to play transition versus transition football against Liverpool, it was a death sentence. It was an absolute death sentence. Even teams that had the individuals to do that, you know, in previous seasons, they didn't want to do that because it was a death sentence. But our kryptonite, for whatever reason, in the last month and a half or so, has been turning these 5v4, 5v3 counterattacking scenarios into goals. And when the game state um, dissolved, and that's what it became, once again, we were unable to make the most of these chances. There you go. Absolutely. So, um, and it, it's it's kind of, uh, it's, it's pretty unfortunate because... It this situation, we get it to the six yard box. Every every decision in this situation is the right pass. Sobaslai's decision to, to pass right um, to go to Salah is the right decision. Salah's um, decision to hold on to the ball and then release Diaz is the right decision. And then Darwin from here, it's neither a cross nor a shot. Um, that for me is disappointing because it's one thing if he just tries to slam this into the roof of the net and it doesn't come off well i'm like okay well at least he knew where the goal was his decision to go across the goal it's, it's like he was crossing to someone that wasn't there and surely he needs to see that no one is crashing the six yard box right now like your one your two options are to try to put it try to stick it in the roof of the net over the legs of the keeper and the trailing defender or square it to silver slide and this he is does neither of those things so Ev, this is it, go, go, sorry go on sorry no i'm just gonna say th these are the moments that frustrate you when it's neither this nor that right so one thing when a player passes when he should have shot or shot when he should have passed this is neither this nor that and that is from a fan's perspective the most in my opinion the most frustrating way to see a chance go begging 
there's two chances of pop on the screen there the first one that you've described where it's a brilliant counter everything is fine even diaz is passed to nunes and i just i'm gonna just do it for the sake of just talking because we're mates we're, we're on a show we've got over 550 of you guys in here mates with us we're discussing it we're allowed to talk you know as as much as we want about past and present and whatever in that first scenario i want you guys to imagine what Bobby Firmino would do with Nunes. I think Bobby would just cut in, faint to shoot with his left, calmly slot into an open goal. That's what yeah. Bobby would do. Or he would calmly pick out Sabozlai with a tap in. That's the first chance, Bobby Firmino. That's the two things Bobby would do. Bobby would never, eight, nine times out of ten, just thrash at it. Right? That's yeah. a prime example of Nunes' movement in the build up of the goal. Perfect. Being on the end, had the pace and the power to get there, perfect, no composure. And in the second chance, where it's a header from Robertson, Mane buries that. Mane buries that, and the thing is just lack of composure in the final moments, in the crucial moments. And these are just two screenshots of, I don't know, six, seven, I don't know where Rush is up to in his chances. But it was happening again and again and again, Calf. It would become a basketball game but it was a basketball game almost camped in their half. And yeah. then it became chaotic, as Evan says. The crowd got up for it because of the equaliser. And then they go and take the lead, mm -hmm. which I, I don't know what to make of it. Like, how are you feeling at this stage? Because I yeah. think even Klopp lost his rag. I thought Pep Linders was calming Klopp down. I thought mm -hmm. the occasion and the situation and the pressure got to Klopp. Hate to say it, I'm gonna say how it is. I think he got to clock for about five minutes. Yeah, but to be honest, you can't blame him. You can't blame him because he has worked all season to manage his squad. He's managed uh injuries, he's rotated, he's bedded new players in. He, as Evan rightly put it, he is works with these players to create these situations, and he is in a title run in with seven games to go. And he is seeing players out there just wasting chances and there's nothing he can do about it. Other than hook on for somebody else. You as a manager, right, coming to the end of your legacy, after all of that hard work, hard work are watching your title, right, your potential second Premier League slip from your fingers because people are missing chances, turning, turning around and smiling about it. I would be fuming as well on the touchline. There comes a point where you forget calm and composure, frustration will take over. And I'm pretty sure if he if he didn't at half time at full time, he would have gone in there raging, right? He would have gone in raging because there comes a point where nicey nicey has to stop. And you just have to go, guys, you're professional footballers, you're paying you know, certain players are being paid three hundred and fifty thousand pounds a week. I'm playing you despite bad form, and you are getting chance after chance after chance. We are in a title running. You need to be doing better, pure and simply, right? So I can understand why he maybe would be frustrated. But fair play, he has a second in command in Pet Linders that was there to balance him off and calm him down. Brilliant. We're a team, right? But do you know what? Evan touched about points of the game where intent, you know, the, the occasion takes over. I had that exact thought. I said, well, whilst watching Liverpool in that first half and we're getting to half time, I was thinking, there's, there's no way United score here. No way. And the only way I think they might is because we've just watched Sheffield United and I sat there thinking there's no way they score and they somehow score. And I was thinking, second as dominant as we've been in this first half, we've got the lead. The first five minutes of a game, the final five minutes of a half, the first five minutes of the second half, and then the final 10 minutes of a game are always in the balance. Forget form, forget who's the better team. It's just moments in a game where you throw caution to the wind and you give things a go, right? And then if you're away from home, the crowd get on side. So coming in out of that second half, I wanted my, I was saying to myself, there's no way they should score. We're the better team. We've been the better team. Everything's right. We've got the lead, but we need to manage these next five, 10 minutes, right? Because it's a neutralizer, those minutes in a game. And I, I wanted, right, our captains on the pitch, to step up. I wanted Virgil to play as he's been playing, which was great, but I wanted Salah to be the guy that comes out and shows the composure. Get on the ball, be the guy that communicates with your forwards, recognise as an experienced player, right, with all the ability 
right, and know-how, been there, done it, to get your foot on the ball and just lead these guys a little bit more. And I don't think that happened. And I just think for a team that is still developing and learning and we've got experience in there, and we've got World Cup winners, as the game's going on, you see United sort of getting a little bit of a feel for the game. I'm then looking at my so-called captains, Virgil, Robertson, Salah on the pitch and thinking, you're the guys that have been here, done it. You've had years under Klopp's tenure. You've been here. You've lost. You've won here. Just help this team out, right? Just control things, manage the game, right? And I don't think they did that. And I don't think they did that at all. And then the chance comes and, it, and it's a, I mean, the hit's, the hit's brilliant. The hit is brilliant. You know, I, I haven't watched it back to see who was at fault. Maybe Curtis should have got out a bit quicker or what have you, but... I watched it back. I watched it back, Cav. Just just so I can hop in on this, we can test the shot. Like we we give him not many windows, dude. Sometimes it, it's the Premier League. Sometimes people just rip it and it goes in. I mean that that's that's what this league is. It, ha it happens almost every other game. He's sometimes a great player, just, man. Yeah, he, he's, a, he's a he's a great he's a great player. He's a he's a great he's a prospect. Player. He's a good player. Yeah. Let's calm down. It, Harvey Elliott's been just as good for okay, like sorry, a season, yeah, but it's the, media, it's the media, it's the media, isn't it? It's the media, it's always mm. the case. But he wasn't great today, he was okay today, barring that moment. I just, we do this all the time, we on players, he's a good player. Like, it used to be you had to show a portfolio to you're actually considered a great player, not play 10 games a season. No, no, no. We just do yeah. that far too yeah, often. Yeah. I know, he's, I know what he's mean, player, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, I know, but I just think, I don't think Harvey Elliott's got enough this season. Curtis Jones bar today where he couldn't play, the, he couldn't run forward for some reason today, but this season he's been very good as well. They don't seem to get the same loving as a player who's played 10 games mm -hmm. who's getting an England cap. That's all I'm saying. But yeah, he, he is a good player, don't get me wrong, but it just seems to be the narrative when certain clubs have a player, it's like they're going to be the next world beater, but nine times out of ten, that let, doesn't really happen. Let, let, let him get all the England caps he wants. Yeah, Here, yeah, yeah. Uh, right, it's... Yeah. It's 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 not a goal I'll be analyzing for a while because it was the first thing I did when I it, as soon as I was done having my existential crisis, you know, because I, I don't like to watch players celebrate. I usually close my eyes, open my eyes again. The replay is happening. I'm like, OK, I guess I can watch the replay um, and we can test the shot. It's just it's just a great shot. And, and, and it happens sometimes. But what I, I didn't really like, and this is sort of go off of Cavs point, I wanted someone to sort of put their foot on the ball and click us back into the gear we needed to salvage a point because at that point clock's ticking. You know what I mean? Like there's not a wealth of time to play with in, in the second half in the grand scheme of things. And that didn't really happen. I mean, McAllister from start to finish was brilliant, but it can't just be him. You know what I mean? Um, Salah would get on the ball in, in midfield and wide in wide areas and he would turn it over. The the passing over five to ten yards wasn't wasn't quite there. So that if, if I had to if I had to criticize us beyond just not converting chances and look to other aspects of the play, I don't think we responded well to to either of their goals. We we eventually pull it we pull one back, but it was through the will, ambition, and spark provided by a 21-year-old off the bench, not by the steady eddy flow that you expect from from the play of your captains. Um, what uh, I've already touched on this a little bit, but another thing that I thought went out the window in the second half, partially due to it becoming more t tennis matchy, to, to, to use the phrase, but also just due to a lack of composure across the board. In the first half, we created higher quality chances because we were patient. Like, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong. We, we had some in-transition moments in the first half where you, you force the turnover and you just got to go and it has to be fast. Totally fine with that. But there were plenty of times in the first half where we were content to recycle possession and work it to a wide area, go around them. And we, we got Robertson on the ball, two great crosses from him. We should have had a goal from one of them. Uh, a, a sense of patience in the creation of the chance itself was lost in the second half. So not only did we not really bring our shooting boots, we sort of lost our, okay, how do we go about maintaining a siege of their box? And that for me is worse than losing your shooting boots because eventually just, just through a sheer process, you can get two goals like we did today, even if, even if you didn't bring your shooting boots, but if you forget how to maintain 
the siege of the opponent's box, the, uh, an opponent's box that's vastly inferior to your own, then that's when you start to really get in trouble. And that was, I, I thought our that, response to adversity today was pretty uninspiring. That was the first time, as I said, I thought we lost composure and head in chasing a game. That was the first time in the whole 90 minutes or whatever it was, we thought, I thought the, we, we started, the occasion got to us. Before mm -hmm. and after that, we were playing so good. But mm -hmm. that twenty minute spell was where the occasion got up. I've left Stephen's uh, comment up on on board. I've given him the fame that he probably craved. Uh, it says an hour of moaning. Uh, take a breather, guys, and look at the league table. Come back and back the team. I don't think any one of us will ever not back this team, Stephen. I don't know how long you've been watching this show over the months, weeks, years. Maybe you're a first timer. We're just going through the game today. If you're happy and you're content and you're fine with today's game, that's mm -hmm. on you. Uh, many, and I'd say majority, aren't. And we're just going through the game events. We absolutely love this team. We back this team to the hill. We love Klopp. We love every single player. I, I'm, I'm looking at the table, Stephen. It's the only thing giving me sanity uh, at the moment. It's, uh, mm. it's an hour Leave of me. analysis and, and chat as opposed to moaning. You know, we don't even talk about the league yet and what it means. Yeah. Well, well no, he's allowed to, to moan about moaners, but he's doing the same thing. What a hypocrite. Uh, you're actually Can... moaning about the moaners. So, yeah, um, it Can is I... what it is. Can I, yeah. uh, Grizz, uh, just because we're at this point in the game, we make a couple of substitutions. I think uh, Harvey Elliott and Gakpo come on. And at this point, we switch to a 4-4-2. And I know in the past, some people seem to think that Klopp's, you know, 4-3-3 and that's it. And we don't, we're not tactically flexible or whatever. Well, he's shown his tactical flexibility again today, as he has done all season. And we switched to a 4-4-2. And I think that somewhat played a part in why we sort of lost our composure a little bit and our control on the game. Because it seems to be a, a reoccurring theme that when we make our substitutions, we have a little bit of a spell where we're still trying to figure things out. And this obviously coincides after they score the goal as well. So they've got a bit of momentum. So that's probably why you see a little period of time where we seem to lack a little bit of control and composure because we're going through this reshuffling, figuring things out kind of pattern. And keeping it to today's game, we pushed Mo Salah into a forward position alongside Cody Gakpo, who I thought actually Cody was good when he came on, actually. He seemed to pick up the ball well and drive through midfield, and that's really what we needed at the time. But, God, when that ball went into Mo Salah, it just felt like everything was going wrong. Like, he was being dispossessed. He was turning, not knowing what to do. He was panicking on the ball. He was giving it away. And this is the guy that spoke, of, I think, earlier in the week. It might have been the week before that said, look, if we're panicking in the games or whatever, give the ball to me. I was like, Jesus, this is this what happens when we give the ball to you? Like, it was bad. And I, and, I, and I was, if we hadn't already made the substitutions, I was thinking we've got to take this guy off because we're carrying somebody here and he's meant to be the lead and the guy we turn to. And he's actually a bit of a hindrance up there for us. I'm keeping the criticism to today's game. I don't think he's been good since the international break. Um, but he is a guy that we are looking to as an experienced forward to really help us across the line in this title charge. And so far, I don't think he's really stepped up since the international break. Today's game was really disappointing. And um, I just think that coincided with going 4-4-2, having a forward that's not playing well or doing anything or even working back or tracking back or working hard or doing anything, to be honest with you. Plus, you know, Cody Gakpo that's out of form, coming back into the team. And we became heavily reliant on Harvey Elliott. I was watching that. I was watching from that point onwards going, get the ball to Harvey Elliott, figure out a way of getting it to him because he seems like the only man on the pitch, not the only, McAllister and everyone else, Robertson still play well or whatever, or Gomez did all right when he came on. But he seemed to be the only guy in the final third that actually knew what he needed to do, when to drive into the box or when to shuffle it back onto his left foot and put a quality into the box. And his crossing was good quality as well. And it's crazy to think that a kid at 21 years of age that really should be starting these games based on form, again, was the guy that I felt reliant on in particular. And it just seems, you know, just seems to absorb forward. information so well, right, Cav? Mm. Because I, you know, it, Klopp should get his flowers here too. You know, he seems to have a knack of knowing when Harvey Elliott needs to get on the pitch and, and what he should do. Because mm. when Harvey Elliott comes on, his job is not always the same. His position is not always the same. The, the instructions aren't, you know, just duplicates of, of last week's instructions. And I was kind of like you because, it, you know, I've always t I already touched upon how it felt like we lost our heads. We weren't sure what our response was supposed to look like. 
and we we make subs okay you know good time to make subs pat on the back for that but the the, the sub that i think seemed to have an earpiece in you know a, a hidden earpiece getting constant feedback from the the coaching was harvey elliott because he seemed to know what the plan was whereas i think a few others had lost their legs lost their heads lost their sharpness or all, all of the above and not for the first time this season. I mean, you, I I would need more more fingers to count how many times Harvey Elliott has had a po- positive impact off the bench this season. Um, Conroy, your thoughts on Harvey Elliott as well, please, if you may, because I was going to yeah. segue onto Harvey Elliott. I was not going to end on a on a dour sour note. We've we've been critical, and I think rightly so. We've moaned about the right things, and I think rightly so. But there is a lot of. Sh- a lot of shining lights about this team. And one of them that has been this ceiling, probably one of the most shining lights, is young Harvey Elliott. I agree with everything Evan and, and Cav have said. Yeah. Um, I was actually thinking, wow, everything is going through Harvey Elliott. He was playing like <laughs> he was playing like Prime Messi in Barcelona, picking up the ball, running, coming in midfield, then playing one twos. He was he was magnificent in that. Game. I think he just knows what he's doing, Grizz. He just knows what he's doing. He's coming on with a clear purpose of what he's doing. And I don't know if that's maybe the deal at the moment. It's like if we're chasing a game, bring Harvey on. And that's the the kind of super sub thing at the moment. He's probably going to bang on the door soon to be like, right, you need to get me away into this this starting lineup because I'm doing more than 20 minutes and having an impact in some games and players are doing for a full 60 minutes. But it's not a coincidence like what Cav said. That's not by accident. Like we've seen this all season. So straight away, Luton, who gets the assist for Diaz header? Harvey Elliott comes on to that kind of pocket position. Crystal Palace, who scores a long ranger from that position to win it at Crystal Palace last 10 minutes? Harvey Elliott. I think who gives uh, Nunes the cross against, I can't remember, it was Brentford, it's the header when it's behind him. I think that's McAllister, Hart, Harvey Elliott. McAllister the did the last minute um, cross, didn't he? Hey, no, that's uh, not on Forest. Uh, the, the, Forest one, oh, yeah, the one at yeah, Anfield. Forest, yeah. The one at Anfield. It was a header. I can't remember who it was against, but it was behind him. I actually can't remember who it was. And there's another one as well off the top of my head today as well. There's there is numerous other uh, incidents of that, but that's not a coincidence. Like there's a lot of faith put put on him because I feel like when he comes on, there's a clear purpose of what he has to do. And to be perfectly honest, me and Cav have discussed this in the past. It kind of pisses me off to be honest because like. When I see him doing that, it makes me compare to other players. Like, why do you not know when you get in those positions what you should be doing? Like, mm-hmm. that, it's not a kickabout with your friends. This is the top end, the highest level where the smallest margins are everything. So that annoys me more, to be honest, that I see a youngster coming on with a clear identity. Oh, this is what I'm doing. This is where I'm going. This is where I'm moving. Whereas other players at times, it's off the cuff football. And I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it is that. But it feels like that when you're comparing it. And that's yeah. very frustrating. Today, off the cuff was enough. If you just had a brain, you but our finishing was useless. Hence why Jurgen Klopp probably took the, the, the double substitution after the goal we conceded when Nunes, um, and I can't remember who else came off, Endo, was probably just the frustration as well. I know there's maybe, you know, get another striker on, but he's probably seen that front line being absolutely useless in front of goal. And this is a player who probably, I think he scored three goals in his career. <laughs> and if Jurgen Klopp is at reacting like that, that shows you how baffling the decision making was today. So I think Elliot's outstanding, but it actually caused me to be more annoyed by seeing the lack of what's the word, assuredness, or yeah. is that the right word of other players, or was assertiveness when in a position, whereas he had that 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 frustrated him a lot. I'm not going to lie, but this guy is going to continue to progress and I think we will have to have the conversation at least next season of as he's in the starting lineup. I think for the end of this season it probably will be that case of last 20, last 30 comes on has that impact for chasing games but what, what about you Grizz because obviously everyone else has had their, has their feeling on Harvey what, what, where do you see he was see he was the start right this is this is the only problem we probably have if he does start is what position does he start in and, and that's that's probably the hardest question we have because when he comes on, as you said, like a four-four-two, that kind of suits him as well. So, Chris, what would what, what's your thoughts on I Harvey don't and know. I don't going know. forward? It's, so, it's, 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 it's frustrating. It's not frustrating. It's a great, it's a great problem to have when you've got such a young player and you're trying to integrate him into the team. I think he's fine where he is ultimately. 
if, if oh, I know it can be sound harsh and unfair at times, but I think he's, I think he's okay. He's going through the phase where Phil Foden was going through at Man City. You got to remember, Phil Foden's twenty five now, and Harvey's twenty one. Yeah, so he's four yeah. years younger. Now, remember Foden four years ago? Coming in and out of the team, people were saying, oh, he needs to play more. But now look at him, you know. And I think Harvey's fine where he is. I know the clamour for him, especially when we see performances from other midfielders like we see today. And you think to yourself, Harvey can change the game. Let's start him. But we know that he doesn't start off games like that. So, mm. look, and again, it will depend on the new coach, how he fits into his system. Is there a system that can get the best out of Harvey Elliott? Or will he continue <coughs> to be a, a good squad player? I want to talk mm. about the penalty, guys. Chris, can I just... Do you mind, just beforehand? I know, I know no one asked me, but I just want to chime in anyway. We play Palace at home next Sunday, right? I would start Harvey Elliott ahead of Mo Salah in that. Right? Because whilst Mo Salah... I'm not, not saying Mo Salah hasn't got the wow. goals and assists all season and I'm not saying he hasn't played his part for where we are, right? But whilst he was away at AFCON, Liverpool did fine, right? Liverpool did fine and it was Harvey Elliott playing major on that right side. I think this team at the minute with where we are in the season are going to be intensity, work hard, fight for everything and I think it needs a selfless player in that forward line. I think it needs one out of the three to be the guy that just is his main, his primary attribute is wanting to get the best out of everybody else as opposed to god i've got to be the guy that gets the goals i'm going to get my head down and run i'm going to i think that he when he gets on the ball he is always looking at can i reverse it for an overlap or play an inside ball or can i put a cross into the box you need one out of the front three in my opinion at this stage of the season to be selfless and just work for the other two because the other two have the the running power they have the fight they have the um they have all the raw ability, but at the minute, and I'm not being reactionary off, off today's game, I'm going off the past three games, I think they're playing too individual. And unless you've got like a, like uh, we have kind of got it in McAllister behind them, like an Odegaard who's a bit selfless and he's, every time he gets on the ball, the first thought is, right, how am I going to feed it to one of my forwards? I don't feel like we've got that necessarily. And I do think that overall as a team, we would benefit from a, a hard working Harvey Elliott that is, is continuing to show the intelligence on that right side and looks for his teammates in the box, as well as the fact that he works hard getting back as well, which Salah seems to have just completely given up on. You know, in today's game, there wasn't a lot of tracking back to, to being done, admittedly, but this guy doesn't isn't interested in doing it at all now. So all I'm saying is it's Palace at home, and it, if it only serves as a bit of a wake-up call for Mo Salah for the final five, six games, fine. But I just think you've got a guy there that's playing really well, selfless, works hard, seems to understand the game. You're at home against Palace. Why not? Why not? When when he was perfectly fine during Afcon. Wow, Cavs dropped a bombshell or hot uh. take or call it what you want just before we thought we're gonna have a nice calming uh, end to the show. Cavs stirred a few pots. Conroy and Evan have to have their say. I think they're eager to have their say. I think they're chomping at the bit to have their say. The chat's definitely having their say. Who wants to go first? Uh, well, you know, obviously there's there's no debate that Salah has not been 100% himself since coming back from international duties and injuries. And we've been remarkably spoiled in Mohamed Salah's career at Liverpool that there haven't really been many injuries to speak of. Plenty of other players have had, you know, significant layoffs and have been afforded the time and the luxury and the patience to come back to their to the to the peak of their powers. But because Mo Salah has, you know, forget the season ending category of injury, you know, it's just we've been blessed with a lot of, you know, just many years of Salah not even really picking up many knocks, really, really things that came out on a, on a weekly basis, really. So, you know, I, I think if anybody deserves some sort of pass to sort of play their way back into form post injury, you know, we have to, you know, hold our hands up and say, well, there's that dude who has always been available uh, for, you know, six, seven years now. Um, the, the, the thing Cav is getting onto about Salah being selfish at times. Yes. This is again, part and parcel of the most Salah experience. He's a goal scorer. He backs himself to score. He takes the penalty off of McAllister today. 
which I did not agree with at all. I think McAllister should be taking penalties for Liverpool. It wasn't a um, penalty, by the way. No, it's, it's <laughs> rare. It, it, to, to be honest, guys, to be honest. Guys, it, was, there, guys was, there any, was there any? Okay. What's going I, on? I, Who's Grizz, let, let me say for, for the first time in my life, I, I turned away Klopp style. I know Klopp watched the penalty today, but I did vintage Klopp. I didn't watch the penalty because as soon as I saw Salah was taking it away from McAllister, I got mad. So I didn't watch. But – Again, I'm, I don't want to get too sidetracked here. I get that occasionally Salah is going to be selfish because that's what all great goal scorers do. Occasionally they they sh- they shoot when they really should pass. But I need to remind us, everybody needs to be reminded, Mo Salah is one of the greatest playmakers in the history of this league. The the, the numbers don't lie. The, you know this, this dude is an incredible at getting his teammates into the game. He knows his, his passing angles. Um, with the outside of the foot, with the inside of the foot, from that right wing position, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he's been 100% himself. He quite clearly hasn't. He needs to pick up his standard. Absolutely, nobody knows that more than him. But I don't think the answer is to start to to to, to drop Mohamed Salah because I just you just have to hold your hand up and look at the numbers. You know, so much is based upon data and analytics these days, and I know for a fact that you are X times less likely to win a game of football when Mohamed Salah is not on the pitch. Um, what what I would advocate for, Kevin, I hope to meet you halfway here, is I don't want him involved on Thursday. Um, I think, you know, he's coming back from injury. He's played, you know, quite a lot of football over the years. I definitely think he needs a rest. I, I, want, I want to see him fresh mentally and physically for, for next weekend. But I am not at the point where when it's so clear that our problems are psychological in front of goal, I don't think we start to sit our one of the club's best goal scorers in its history, you know, when quite clearly we need a psychological confidence boost in front of goal. You, need, you just need to keep putting players in the positions to score goals. And I don't, I don't think taking him off the pitch is a good remedy for that. Mm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue too much. I know if you come for the king, you know, you better come prepared and all of that, right? All I'm saying is there's seven Premier League games left. Harvey Elliott seems to be showing real quality and intelligence. Salah's going through bad form. I'm sorry, bad form can continue for seven games and we don't win the league. Like, all I'm saying is there comes a point where you have to go, I've got Palace today. I've got a guy that's really young and and not particularly experienced, right? As much as Salah, but playing particularly well. Or you rely on the guy finding his form again. And, and which and everyone's can we not gonna do that. Thing. Can we not do that? Sorry, Con. I know you probably won't have a say, but very quickly, can we not do that in the Atlanta game as opposed to the, the, the Premier League, which is the end all and be all? Can we not just rest Salah for Atlanta? Maybe if you want to rest him, or is the Atlanta game the recipe to get him back into form? What I will say in defense of Mohamed Salah, I he is a very deeply religious man and he has been fasting. As far as Konate, so that might be an, a, an issue with Konate being rested as well. But Mohamed Salah will be his last fast. Oh, yes, by the time the next game comes around, I'm hoping that we will see a different Salah because he won't be fasting. So let's see how that goes. And, po- and, po- and possibly, Grace, do you think? Sorry, I'll keep putting in here. Oh, sorry. That, that, that injury, and, and I'm only throwing it out there, I, I, I don't believe in this myself, but that injury, as Evan put it, right, he's always available. He's always reliable. He takes such good care of his physical, you know, his body and his health. And, you know, you often see him on social media doing a lot of gym work, a lot of stretching. He has looked after himself incredibly well. This injury wasn't, you know, a kick on a pitch. It was it was a hamstring, if I'm not right in saying so. Is that the first time he's maybe looked at it in a little career and gone, hold on, my my perfect body is 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 had a little bit of a knock there, you know. My my all that stretching, all that hard work I'm doing now, I believe in myself. I know I'm thirty plus, but I know that I've carried myself so well. Suddenly he gets a hamstring injury, and he is he maybe just you know just a little bit wary of it, you know, a little bit wary in the game, thinking, you know, I'm not as not as I, perfect I think, as I, I perhaps think, thought I was. I think I think. There is something, man. That injury is the first time, and it's the kind of injury where, regardless of what we think or whatever you do, it's all about speed, and directness, and power and pace. So I, I think they they do try to take their toll eventually. 
But Conroy, you haven't had a say on this, the Salah debate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the thing about that, that's a fair point as well, Cav. But to be fair, Salah's not been like bursting past people 1v1 for a long time. His game has slightly changed in parts. It's like he gets in the box to get the chances. He, he's always scored goals like that because he's in the box a lot. And his link-up play has definitely improved to try and be a more playmaker at times this season. But I take your point because he is someone who's had such a, a good record of injury uh, before that. I would say, for me, I'm very honest about Salah and I've said it lots of times his best habit is scoring when he plays bad even today does it against penalty he scores all the time when he doesn't play well like it's his best trait and he against Brighton for example shocking in front of goal gets the winner it's, it's going to be like that against Palace it's not really about how the overall, overall performance is it's just about winning the game and I think you have to just have him and by the way his form's probably not, not going to improve to the end of the season He's probably going to be maybe a little bit better, but he's probably not going to be amazing. But it's just about winning games. And as Evan says, the numbers don't lie. I always review his performance, and I think there's a lot of games like that. It's not new where he doesn't play well, but he does have moments. And I think it might be like that against Palace. So for me, I, I would actually debate more with you that Elliot's to start in midfield in that game. There's definitely an argument for that because he's he's probably, even if he can get a partnership with Salah on that side in that game, 100% I'd be... I could agree with that as well. But I just think going into that game, following today, it's going to be a tricky one. And just like the Brighton game, I just think you need him on the park because he does have these moments. He'll, he'll do, he'll have 20 minutes where you're just frustrated as anything, anything with him. But just like in the, the, the Brighton game, he had that great pass, he has that finish. He just, he's got that, he's, he's got that, what's the word? He likes to be not as the main character, but the, the guy, the guy to to be the the tallies man for the team, and right. I, I think he's just shown up so many times in those moments that I would go against dropping him for the Palace game. But I would put Elliot into midfield because I think he's done more than enough to to warrant even a not a gamble. But we've seen a few times Grizz and Evan. I know we spoke about this in the past, where it's like he'd, he'd come on and be brilliant, and then he'd start like a Europa game and not be as good. But then you could come back to me and say, well, that's not the first team. That's not the, f the first team starting 11 in, in Europa League. So I think my argument would be more that Elliot des deserves a start in midfield for that game over, yeah. obviously not McAllister, but over um, either Sobo or if Jones is going to start. That would be my, my debate on that one. But City, I, 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 City yeah. dropped Haaland, didn't they? And not, not dropped, but you know, City didn't start Haaland. They started Alvarez against uh, Villa, am I right? So, so you know, uh, but that, 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 again, that, 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 that's also someone coming back from an injury, Cav. So, so I think I think so often, so many so many choices in selection are sports science based, mm -hmm. um, and and we and we don't realize it. If Klopp had his way, Kanate would play sixty games a season, but but he can't because. Sports, the, the sports scientists and physios will step in and say, no, this is what the numbers say about his lactate levels and this, that, and the other. So so, so often, I, I, I think we forget that managers at the highest level have to defer to people with PhDs in kinesiology and medicine. That, 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 that's KDB how, that's was the same, wasn't it? Yeah. Kevin De Bruyne got done the same thing as well like he's yeah. not been 100% for about a year I think so exactly and, and guys and again after after City Arsenal there was a whole Twitter debate amongst all the cool kids about whether Erling Haaland the guy who scored more goals than I had years on the clock last season it does does he make Man City better or worse Erling Haaland I mean th this is that we've reached the the part this part of the season where there's this type of head loss about about the the big players and you know I've, I've said so much is deferred to by numbers here's a number for you out of all attackers in europe's top five leagues this season nobody has a greater expected assist output than Mohamed salah the guy is a playmaker mm. he's an absolute have, playmaker is, and, and he always has been i think there's going to be a period of adjustment now with salah obviously for the rest of the game for the rest of the season i should say and if he continues with us for his final season or two in terms of what do we expect from Salah? What kind of player is he now? What advantages, what what, what attributes does he have that we can utilise as he showed in that last period where Harvey Elliott puts him through? The Mohamed Salah of three years ago sprints away and tucks that away. He wasn't mm -hmm. able to get the ball under control or sprint away. But it's nature, it's absolutely normal. He's evolved, like, Cavs, like Evan says, 
into a playmaker of supreme, supreme ability. And maybe it takes an adjustment time for us fans as well to, to see that because we're so used to him being the, you know, liquid gold goal scorer, supreme. Mm -hmm. You know, so maybe it's an adjustment from our side as well to see that this guy is a different player now. And therefore, the onus needs to be on the Diaz, the, the Nunes, is the Gakpos to score the goals. And I'd probably, I'd probably weigh more criticism on them. But that's just me and everyone else is, including Cavi, including Conor, including Evan, and all the chat is allowed to say how they feel. I think that was a very good segue. Thanks for that. Um, but we need to obviously segue into the final section of the show. And obviously everybody wants to know what now? What now? Obviously take away the always take away the first set of line of fixtures. I couldn't find anything else, guys. You know me. I just found some screenshot of a TV of a <laughs> some <laughs> This. I mean, come on! Do you really think I got time to make graphics out here? I, I, I obviously know this is this season, but if you just went off the quality of this, you think it's vintage, like Premier League years. <laughs> I mean, come on! Do you really think I've got gra time for graphics? Come on, get out of here! I, I, you know, I, I think we should. You should just go with a, a screenshot of the current league table because at this point, we all know who Man City and Arsenal have to play next. We, I, I don't even need to see the fixture list anymore. I can tell you exactly what their schedule is. It's mad. Between now and we the know, rest we of know each other's schedules like the back of our hands. Okay, I'm going to put it out there. I think there will be points dropped. I don't think we're allowed to drop any more points. I don't think we're allowed to drop. The next set of points we drop, I think the title is over. That's just me. I said it. Sorry, what I mean by that. Okay, let me rephrase. I beg your pardon. So 10 games ago, I said 26 points is the maximum amount of points, minimum amount of points we will need to get the title. That was 10 games. Now it's seven games to go. We've dropped points in two of those, I think. Or have we? I can't fucking remember now. But you get my point. I, I don't think Man City, I think Man City, the only way Man City drop points is Spurs. I think they win the rest of their games. And I think they win them comfortably. Mm. Um... Arsenal's running is very tight. I think they can drop points in definitely one, maximum two. Neither of these three teams, I think, lose a game till the end of the season now, including us. But draws, draws, draws. Your thoughts, guys, very quickly on the running. <clears throat> I, I agree. I think Man City win every game. To be honest, I can't see where they drop points. I know that they've got the Champions League, much like Arsenal, to sort of wrestle with as well. Um, I think the games that come sort of after the first legs could be quite tricky. Um, but yeah, I, I think we've got to be perfect from here on in. Uh, I, I would say we've got to win all of our games just to make sure we stay ahead of Man City. I agree. I think Arsenal could probably drop points against maybe Spurs um, or maybe Chelsea, crazy enough. I don't, I don't know, but... Um, yeah, I just I worry about Man City more. I just think I just think they're they're in that mode, and I think they'll just win all their games. And for us to stay ahead of them, I think we've got to do the same. Hello, Connery. Seven wins out of seven. Cav says I believe if we win seven games, we win the title. Now I know that's the obvious thing to say, but some people are saying no. But we need to get the goal difference now because I believe Arsenal will drop points. But in order for us to win the league, we need to win seven games in a row. I'm I'm going to back what I said last week. I, I think today was massive. I think this was yeah. a big, big moment for our season, and when we let ourselves down, the players let us down. And um, yeah. for me, that's it. Um, I think with the logic of Man City, I wouldn't disagree with that. I'd say maybe the Spurs game, possibly it's the only one. It literally, is the only but one, then, guys. Don't bother getting hopes high and think. Don't, don't give me this romantic football. Yeah. Man City don't do romantic football. Romance. Man no, City no. don't do this. They're, yeah. the, they're the they're the they're the they're the oddity in teams dropping points and you know when they get in this vein of form and we've seen it the proof is in the pudding absolutely they, absolutely you know, they win every game to the end of the season they've had and they've got that experience as well and right now they'll love it they'll love it right now because the the kind of the spotlight is not on them right now and they'll be able to just keep going and i think today 
Arsenal look brilliant. Do not get me wrong. Arsenal do look brilliant. You have to give credit. I think they've improved so much from last season. Uh, I'm not jumping on the Havertz bandwagon, to be honest. That's the one thing I won't do. But Declan Rice has been outstanding for them. But what I would say, each week goes on. Each weekend, there'll be so much focus and pressure. It'll be different. That squad won't be used to that. Because even last season, I think, was about eight games they had left. Uh, or was it seven when, when City took over? So that's going to be an experience on that squad. And then it's going to get interesting. But I hate I hate having to look at other teams' fixtures. At the end of the day, <laughs> see if you want to win, do it, your, do it yourself. It's pretty simple. And that's why I'm feeling deflated today, because... We had a lesson, unlike other years, we had a little reminder, you know, you're actually not too good at Old really? Trafford. Maybe don't but don't be delusional or naive or stick your chest out and say, you know, I'm great here. You're not because you've had two wins and 10 visits under Klopp. So let's not jump the gun against every year. My United have been pretty poor most of the time and we've never put them to the sword. So see, we had that reminder and the squad still today wasn't ruthless enough. And ultimately, that's why Klopp was going crazy on the sidelines because he understands, firstly... He was, he's got his fame because he turned in a Borussia Dortmund team who are full of momentum. The yellow wall to beat Bayern Munich is all about momentum. Football, in his mind, is about momentum. He knows Old Trafford. It is like Anfield to, to United players. It is. It's not as bad, but there's definitely something in there where it just makes us not play well enough or we never quite click. And he knew that it's, don't give them anything. Don't give them anything. And then with those missed chances, I think he just lost his head, head today a bit like me. I just, I don't know, mate, to be honest. I, I really feel like today, not to say it's over, it's over. I just think today was absolutely crucial and we've let ourselves down. And if I look at Arsenal, possibly Wolves away as well, maybe a draw on that one, it's quite a hard one. But everyone thought Brighton would be a hard game. And to be honest, the Zerbe, like, like he is, like last week I'm praising him, this week I'm like, he's hot and cold as a manager. Sometimes his teams play at Barcelona, sometimes they play... Like they've not been training all week. They're kind of, you kind of mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. Um, I don't know, Villa. Chris. Right now, if you if, if you ask me to put money on it right now, if you ask me to say who I think who's going to win, I'd say Man City right now. I think Man City. I think we'll drop points again because we conceded a, a goal against Sheffield United, the worst team in the league. We conceded the goal against them. So, Cav, your point about you can't concede, football's mental, mate. You get a 25-yard shot, it takes three deflections and goes in. Goals can happen at any time. I feel like Aston Villa away, that's going to be enormous now. Fulham away is going to be enormous as well. And Spurs at home, let's not forget, title run-in, we lost by one point, we drew with Spurs at home. Everyone seems to forget that game. That was massive. So, if you ask me to be optimistic right now, Grizz, I'm struggling. Um, So, yeah, (laughs) that sums that up. I'll let you in on a secret, Conroy. That Spurs draw at home was the first league game I got to that season. So it's your fault. I'm not, yeah. I'm not going to this hello. one. I was there as well. Why didn't you say hello? Because, oh because for one time. reason or another, I could, I could, I couldn't, I couldn't make it to other games. And 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 I, I, I was in the title running. I said, I I'm going cool. to this game regardless. Yeah. I, I got there. Cool. I got there, and we drew. And I just. I was deflated the entire way home and I said, it's me. It's Can I say fault. something, guys? It's my fault. Can I say something? Oh, maybe no. I've got a bit of that feeling that I had. You know, at Spurs home, I knew we we're not going to win it. Yeah. yeah. It's not quite the same because that was closer. There was about three, four games left after that. Okay. Um, whereas this one's seven games to go. So a lot more can happen. I genuinely don't believe the media and other fans' notion that we've got the easiest running. I have no fucking idea. When you look at that Man City running and you can't say they've got the piss easiest running. Arsenal, I give them, they've got quite a tricky one. But Arsenal, they look quite consistent they're now, Arsenal, though, don't they, Greg? Like Even Man City, they're quite up and down. Like Even conceding first against Palace, Arsenal just t- seem to be so like consistent every performance, solid defensively. So... You can only maybe say the pressure would get to Arsenal and that would allow us to, to jump in. But I think I'll be more optimistic <laughs> in a week's time. Champions uh, League will play its part. Uh, sorry, uh, Evan, how many, how, many do we, um, how many do we need and are we going to do it? I mean, well, there was, there was a time this season where 90 points didn't look like the floor that was mm-hmm. required. 90 points is absolutely the floor required now. Maximum amount of points that we in Arsenal can get is 92 maximum amount of points man city can get is 91 um man city have a pretty easy run in uh i'm i'm going to be pretty honest 
They, I see they a few they, teams. They don't, I, they don't, they, the only game they drop points, bookmark it, screenshot, clip it up, play it back, send it to me. I'm telling you now, Man City win all those games. Probably Spurs as well. I know we got hope. I think five, they smashed them. Five no win for Man City. Five no win for Man City. I, I, I don't know. City, City, here's the thing. No yeah. matter how mortal City can look by their own standards, keyword their own standards, they always have a gear where they can win however many games in a row needed to to win. They they did it last season. They were trailing Arsenal last season. They won every single game, I think. Um, Arsenal, I think, are currently the best team in the Premier League. As things stand, they look defensively the most robust. They look like they have just the most confidence within themselves. Um, but Arsenal, I do think, have the trickiest set of fixtures to go. They have they have fixtures against teams that have, still have things to play for. They have fixtures against um, mortal enemies. Um, they, yeah, they, they do have a tricky set of fixtures, but I do think they're the best team in the league as things stand. Liverpool, you know, Grizz, last time we did this, we've been doing this every week for two, you know, freaking months, for months now. Um, <laughs> I said I would want to have saved our dropped points away from home for Villa away. It's just today was so frustrating because yeah. I look at our remaining fixtures. I see three better teams than Manchester United yeah. there, That's and they're exactly not all why. and they're not all at home. I I I think West Ham are just as good as United. Uh, Tottenham are better than United, and Villa are better than United. So. That's frustrating. Um, I think Liverpool do have to be perfect. If I'm going to be honest, I, I see I, Liverpool cannot lose a game. But let me let me just put it that way: Liverpool cannot lose a game. Liverpool can afford one more draw on the road, max. And again, that that requires other things to happen. But yeah, we we've used up our 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 grace game, if if you would call it already. And it, it's unfortunate because we absolutely should have bounced. Yeah. Bounced United three one four one, added our goal difference a bit and maintained it in our hands, but it wasn't to be. So now perfection is is basically required. Um, these players are going to have to look deep within themselves to see if they have that gear. Mm. There you go, guys. Um, we haven't sort of beat around the bush. Told you this is exactly it. Um, what I was going to say, there's a couple of super chats. One, call me crazy, yo, was good, says, but Arsenal are less likely to drop points even with the fixtures. The defensive structure sets them apart from us. They, they, just, don't, they just don't concede shots, you know? Yep. They, they are the antithesis of what we saw today, you know, in, in Manchester United. They just do not concede. Forget chances. They just don't let teams shoot. Shane says, and this is the one small maybe glimmer of hope that we cling on to. He says, if both make the... Um, um, what am I doing? Sorry, guys. If both make the Champions League semi-finals, City play away to Forest. City play away to Forest, home to Wolves and away to Fulham. Arsenal play away to Spurs, home to Bournemouth, away to United. Points will be dropped playing one another late in the season. Mm. Are we hoping to be in the semi-finals of the Europa League at that same week as well? Mm. I, I guess... The standard of playing each other, yes, all the pressures, and yeah, I get all that. I get all that, and that's the glimmer of hope that we keep clinging on to as Liverpool fan base. We have to do, we have to do something. That Champions League, so are we just saying basically, guys? Do we all agree that we want Arsenal and City to progress this week or in this round and play each other? You you want them? You want the second legs to be in the balance? So they have to go through. You, you know, both both teams are. No, I'd cap- say go through because they play each other, Cap. Oh Not right, sorry. Legs. Yeah, I was just focusing on this round. Yeah. I just want I just want to make sure that both legs are as, as tough as possible for these guys. That you know, I, I, I've not. <sighs> Arsenal could go there and get a few goals against Bayern, and then second legs just you know. Of course, they have got to still play a strong line. Is the first leg away? But I'd have to double check. I can't remember. Not sure if you guys are. Aware. Mm. After I think, I think the first legs, I think they play them at home. I think Emirates okay. is the first leg. I might be wrong. But what I wanted to say, Grizz, as well, last week there was a lot of criticism. Uh, and it was not the fans. The fans went over the top. But Arteta and the way Arsenal approached that Man City game. But it's only taken a week for that to look like a genius move now because they're top of the league because of that. They got battered mm-hmm. by City and went all out. Uh, so, you know, you, you have to say that 
they look like they are evolving each season. They're looking at what they've done previous year and how to improve. Um, like last year, was it 4-1? Haaland scored the goal, took took the, the ponytail out. They went this year, 11 men behind the ball. But I don't care what you say. There's there's more than one way to play football. If it gets points on the board, we it's drew man, with Man City playing much better. But see, at the end of the season, it's irrelevant. It's about the points. So that's taken one week. And that already looks like a smarter move by Arsenal last week. Uh, shout out to Quasibo TV, a regular on the call-in show. He says, big up, Grizz. Next call-in, I will have to reevaluate the next seven matches. You will indeed, my friend, and the rest of you, excitable Liverpool fans. I did try to tell you guys. <laughs> they, were all, they were all claiming in Quasi. They were like, oh, Grizz, you're being so negative. We're winning all 10. We're winning all 10. Well, now look at us, guys. Now look at us. Squeaky bump time. Yes, the title is was a mistake. It was supposed to be a question mark. Many have slagged me for that. Many have slagged me for my graphical uh, expertise as well by using someone's screenshot. I mugged someone's screenshot of a screenshot. Fuck me, I'm a genius. Um, but this is it, guys. This is Squeaky Bump Time. We have no time to rest. Straight away to the quarterfinals, I believe, yes, of the Europa League. Palace. And then those awful, awful three away fixtures in six days where I believe the title will be decided at the end of those three games. Let's hope Liverpool are still, are still at top of the table after those three games. And if they are, we shall win the title. We haven't given up on this team. If you think we've just spent the best hour of hour and a half, 45 minutes moaning, fair play to you guys. But we haven't. We've tried to be rational, we've tried to be logical, we've tried to support where we can, and we've tried to critic positively or critically analyze where we can. Redfellas has been your show tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. Still 450 of you guys in here. Smash the like on your way out. Subscribe if you haven't already. Go and check out the guys on their socials. We shall be back next week, God willing. Better, happier faces. Um, and a Mohamed Salah hat trick. Hey, Kev.